Today's topics, we are going to be talking, and well, as soon as Luke ever gets here, about uh, the new X-Ray X4 and uh, first impressions. Luke is a team driver for X-Ray, and uh, this weekend he actually had a chance to get out there and uh, try out the new platform and see if he liked it or not. So that'll be cool. We'll find out that. Cool looking. Definitely cool looking. It looks really cool. Like, it looks super sleek. Uh, I did have some video up here of him ripping around. It's kind of glitchy because I shot it in really high resolution, which StreamYard does not want to broadcast through. <laughs> there he is. There's Mr. Luke. <clears throat> There's Mr. Pittman right there. What's up, guys? Like we were talking about you or something. <laughs> well, weren't you? Of course we were. So yeah, uh bad things about you. Yeah. I mean yeah, good things. You know. Yeah, yeah. So everybody say hi to Luke. This is Luke. Hi hey, Luke. <laughs> Let's uh put a couple of shiny things up here and so we got some stuff to talk about. So what I got going here is uh I have the X ray twenty twenty one and the X four. So the T four and the X four. Mm -hmm. And Luke, down here, is going to explain the big differences to us between what happened with uh, why they changed things over. And, um, yeah, you know, so where do you want to get started? What's the biggest, I guess the biggest thing we want to talk about uh, is going to be, let me find a shot here of the chassis, the big differences here in the chassis. Well, I mean, it's not only just the chassis. I mean, the whole thing is drastically different. Um, right. The suspension, the arms, the top deck. Uh, yeah, everything. It's it's a whole complete new platform. Um, X-Ray's been developing it for, I believe, three years uh, in the background um, while they've been still continuing to support and work on the, the T4. Right. Um, and, you know, like, let's be honest, we have to admit that the uh, the design and the the coming to the market of the automatics really forced other dry or other uh, manufacturers to rethink their uh, basically their geometry and their their um, their design ideas. So yeah, their layout. Yeah, the layout. I mean, they've they've got the center of gravity so much lower, and they've got the you know the suspension geometry, the length of the arms, the length of the drive shafts. Uh, pivot points of the of the axles, all those things uh, were, you know, obviously very well engineered. Um, but what came or, or what happened, I think, that caused that the need for that was the increased grip that we've been racing on. So, you know, on on lower grip stuff, uh, asphalt and and gray carpet, the old style suspension, the the T four style suspension, was very very good. But as grip started to increase, tires got softer, um, traction compound uh, started to be, you know, more potent and and uh, and I guess aggressive. Uh, the need to redesign the suspension came about to support all that extra grip and extra downforce. Um, in addition to faster motors, so the cars are going faster than they ever have, right? So, right. so yeah, X-Ray had to take a step back and and look at what the Automatics was doing. In turn, which um, you know, Mugen uh, also looked at, and Serpent, and, and basically all of the main manufacturers all got on the on board of this style of design. So this is X-Ray's take on it. So I guess, um, yeah, obviously platform, the whole thing is all different. But the biggest thing that jumps out at you right away. Uh, biggest visual change when you look at it right off the bat is I'll get to these little suckers right here. These guys right here. Yeah. This Make this yeah. This is one of the one of the points that X Ray. Um, huh. No, let's not do that. Kind of. They they did a little different than other manufacturers. I, oh, don't I lost the, it. <laughs> I don't believe X Ray is the first company ah. to insert. Uh, carbon fiber into plastic. Um, I know that there's other arms you can buy where you screw carbon fiber plates into plastic arms. Right. But uh, the the process in which X-Ray uh, achieves what they have with the carbon fiber actually pressed into and inlaid in the addition of the plastic arm. 
uh, get back to it again. Yeah, yeah it, it, is. it is something that they, <laughs> that they have patented, uh, and they believe it. It has the best of both worlds of the carbon fiber feel, the stiffness and rigidness of the carbon fiber, with the durability and the flexibility of the plastic. So, you know, it's the team's belief that this is really the best of all worlds. So, I never had a chance to really look at yours up close. I didn't look at it that closely. I also never saw it apart. You had it all assembled and ready to rip on the track. These inserts here, um, are these like a tight press fit in? Um, like I know one of the things they were trying to do with the carbon fiber and the plastic is they were trying to get rid of the sloppiness that happens with some of them, like Awesomatics, which I have one here. Once those carbon fiber arms start, the little ball cap plastic pieces, they start to wear out, right? And then yeah, I think you're going to find that in in anything of this shape. Like even in our full size cars, your right stuff wears out. So so um, yeah, it is a very tight and very um, precise fit when you snap those ball studs um, into the arm and you use the uh, the Huddy multi tool here. I got one. Too. I actually think we talked about the multi tool last time I was. Oh yeah, I think so. I don't know where it is, but I got I got it somewhere. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. They're, they're multi tool to pop in ball cups. And yeah, I've got mine. One of us must have one. I've got it in my race <laughs> Oh, here it is. I got it, Travis. Yeah, that guy. Those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you don't have one of these, uh, you pretty much have to have one. This is this is kind of a requirement for this car, for any car, in my opinion. Um, right. Yeah. So everything's a really, really snug fit. There's, I like that there's not the you know the traditional um, camber links like they had before with the ball cup and the ball stud. This fit is definitely a little tighter, uh, and you can tell when you build it. But again, you don't want it perfectly tight though. You want the suspension free and everything. So there should be a tiny bit of play in everything. Right, but we're talking. <clears throat> quarter of a millimeter instead of a millimeter of play <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you've got a millimeter of play you've definitely got some work to do yeah yeah absolutely. you have some issues yeah. so uh your first impression on it when you were running it you seemed pretty impressed yeah um, it's it's certainly different uh than the previous car um this last weekend obviously was my first time on the track with it and right from the get-go like i built it right absolutely to the kit uh setting so followed the manual and built it as per the manual Put it on the track, and you know, like I was fast right away. Um, I wasn't as fast as I had my T4, uh, but the car was very easy to drive, very stable. Um, it didn't take long for me to get the the settings right to make it have a little bit more steering and do the things that I wanted. Right. Mm -hmm. One of the big things I noticed a lot of uh, talk about was these shock towers on the front, how they are separate from. Like they're not like your standard carbon fiber, like the like the 2021 had, where it was this carbon fiber piece across the front or across the top that your shock mm -hmm. towers are or your shocks are mounted to. These actually allowed a little bit of flex. So, how much adjustment is there in the? Uh, I know there's a spacer you can put in here to stop the flex from this way. Yeah, you can limit the flex a little bit. Um... As far as I know, everybody on the team, the team guys have all been running it except for one guy <coughs> removed. Um, but uh, I haven't personally removed them yet to test with it. Okay. Um, What's the advantage? Well, when you, as soon as you eliminate flex, you are basically making that end of the car more stable. Um, right. So it becomes easier to drive. Uh, you know, like when you want to start to achieve more grip at one end of the car, you generally would start to make that end of the car uh, flex a little bit more. Um, there's already so many flex uh, settings in the chassis that we don't right. really, I haven't got to play with that one yet. How much time do you think you've put in on this car just the weekend that we were just this weekend? Or have you had a chance to? No, that was it. Like I built it, uh, I built both of them Thursday before the club race and then and then we raced Saturday and Sunday. So that was that's all I've had with it. And then Sunday, Saturday night is when I kind of made the most progress with it. And then Sunday, um, it was just really minor little tweaks and testing a couple of bigger things. 
so you were fast with it right out of the box. That was obvious. Uh, like I said, I'd show the video, except it really, it really kind of lurches. Um, but I mean, you think, do you see yourself being half a second, a lot faster with this platform as opposed to the old one? What well, that, 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 that depends entirely on track size. Um, it's a lot harder to be a half a second quicker on a tiny track. Right. I don't, I, I actually think still right now I'm slower than I previously was. I just don't have enough time with the car yet. Right. You know, right. Don't, don't forget that with the T4, like I've been working on that car for seven years to the, almost Basically. to the, almost yeah. to the weekend, actually. Um, that was the, the T4 was the first car I ever had. And that was seven years ago that I bought it. Um, so I've had seven years to work on that, the, that car and understand the setup and the theory and the weight transfer and all those different things and all that is completely different on this car so starting again right talk to me in seven years i guess <laughs> talk to you in seven years no it won't take me that long I'm, I'm heading down to richmond this weekend to go race with those guys down there and i suspect i'll have it mostly figured out by the end of that weekend and then um the following weekend we have a club race again and then the monday i immediately head to uh Cleveland for the indoor champs. So that'll be the real test to see where the pace is. Cause I know where I should stand up against most of those guys. Just going to find a picture here that I thought was quite interesting as well. Um, this here. So <laughs> body post style. I mean, I, I love this. This is freaking awesome because one of the things I hate about mounting a body is nine times out of 10, these back posts end up going right on the curve of the back window or some part of the body line oh for scale spec yeah that can be a pain in the butt for scale yeah spec. right and now you've got your your body poster coming straight out the back going to the back bumper basically or above yeah the back bumper, right? so on the car you have the option of mounting the vertical or horizontal like that in that picture on the right and um i i still have mine uh, mounted vertical uh mm -hmm. personally i I don't think there's a tremendous amount of advantage in touring car to, to running them horizontal. Um, and in fact, I think you actually might lose a little bit of downforce because the, the body posts, just flex. my opinion, I could be wrong, but they yeah. might flex a little bit and take some of that. Um, I, I do intend to try it one day. Uh, just there's so many other things to test, test first. Yeah. Stick with what you know for now. Yeah. Well, what I don't know, <laughs> right. So I get to learn all the basics of the car first. It does make a nice clean look. Oh, it's gorgeous. So, you can so so the last couple of years, X-ray has been really working on fine-tuning that T4 platform in terms of little details like um, you know, changing the spur gear and the battery backstops and the battery hold downs and like all the kind of the little extra stuff that it doesn't really affect the performance, but just makes the car that much nicer to work on. And they really made that a focal point of the X4. And you can tell that because they have, you know, the, the uh, battery backstops in the motor mount also act as belt tensioners. They're right. equidistant from the spur gear. They're, they're already built and set up for the exact perfect distance away from the chassis or from the center line of the vehicle. So your battery is about a millimeter away from your spur. Um, the battery hold downs they included, you know, you're not using tape anymore. Um, they're fully adjustable um just all, the, all the little details they absolutely nailed the fact that you can change the spur gear uh without taking anything out of the car you basically just undo three screws and pop the spur gear off and put a new one on it's easy yeah that's pretty slick yeah it is there's a number of really really nice little subtle features like that so aaron you tell me what what do you want to ask you've been racing more than me <laughs> what your questions fire away what was like the feel of the car like, initially? Um, it definitely it so it was rounder in the corners to me. Um, I had my 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 T four was kind of a uh, you know it rotated either either it was either pushing mid corner or it rotated really really hard and was very hard to drive. Um, the the X four is just feels rounder, more linear in the corners. Um, you can tell it's definitely capable of carrying more corner speed and i think that's mostly due to the fact that the axles are in line with the basically the what would be called what would be considered a kingpin um they the pivot point of the axles are 
uh, directly in line with that kingpin. And I think all those little things come together um, to make it just feel more planted, easier to drive, and um, yeah, just carrying that corner speed easier with less setup work. Um, I think the the setup window on the T4 is very fine to get to that point where you're constantly competing in the upper end of of the racer at the you know you start getting into you know a narrower and narrower setup window uh and i suspect the x4 is going to be a larger setup window i think it's going to be more capable um and be less reliant on having a perfect setup yeah so they can get away with you know going from round two grip to round three grip and not doing changes right yeah, I mean, you're going to have to do little things like that, no matter the car. But I just mean, like, to get your car so it feels good on any track, I think is going to be slightly easier with the with the X4 than the T4. So, um, for setup stuff, uh, like, your general adjustments and stuff are pretty much all the same style of setup. Like, do you find changing camber, caster just as easy to do on this platform and the new one as it was the old um camber in my opinion is a little bit actually harder on this one um yeah. some are going to say it's easier because of the way it's designed but i i think it's a little bit not harder because it's not hard but it's a little bit more finicky um just because of the style of that design the caster is uh is just simply inserts so right. you just take out one insert put a different one in and put the screws back on it takes only a few minutes to change um both front and rear now we have rear caster management now versus the t4 which um you know you can only get that by using different hubs um the the rest of it like the roll centers are the the upper roll centers are very easy to adjust the lower roll centers are more difficult to adjust um although x-ray is making some shims to make that a little bit easier um the flex settings obviously are quite are quite simple uh yeah I'm, I'm still getting used to used to it um i definitely don't i don't really love how you adjust the low roll center but i'm not sure how else they would have done it um, right you know you're you have to finally hold a you know a one or two or one and a half mil worth of shims and tiny in a little spot and feed a screw through without it sliding around it's it's quite finicky so, so you, you, have, you have to hold your tongue just the right way yeah yeah you do so i think the the lower roll center i think i found the setting that i like and i'm just going to leave it there now until i sell the car see if they got an image that zooms it in a little better so you can see there you go yeah that one there shows you so the the shim the little two mil shim on the on the left side of that arm um i'm gonna change it as soon as I change it, it changes it. <laughs> Try to make it bigger. Make it bigger, Captain. Well, we'll get there. It's scrolling and scrolling. Oh, there we go. Scrolling. Yeah, so, <laughs> so on the left side of that arm that's disassembled, the left front, you'll see that two mil shim. Um, on the bottom, that one there, yeah. So that's the one that sits between the uh, the ball stud and the... the um, not oh, sorry the pivot ball and the chassis so you have to actually thread a screw up through the chassis through that two mil into the into the uh, pivot ball which while you're building the car is easy but once it's assembled and you're trying to do it in a rush between rounds uh, it's it's very annoying so right like i said i found the settings i like and i likely won't change them now so i'll work on another setup so i guess a uh, good question the settings that you're running on this thing uh, obviously you didn't just pull them out of your, out of thin air. Um, how long have, how exactly how long do you think the guys from X-Ray over in Europe have been running and working with this platform? Uh, so they've been able to kind of ballpark it for everybody so you can get it out there and get going. Yeah. Well, so they, my, I don't know for certain, but my guess would have been about three years ago, I heard they started the development of it. So about two years was probably spent engineering and designing parts and all that. And then and then they probably started the testing a year ago. And um, uh, in Europe, I know that Alex and Bruno and Martin and perhaps other guys have been running it um, for about six months, I would say. 
uh, maybe a little bit more. And then here in North America, Drew, uh, Robbie, and Max have all been testing with it on black carpet for a few months as well. Um, well, maybe longer, maybe six or eight months. Mm -hmm. And so within that testing, Drew, uh, you know, kind of came up with the starting setup and that's posted on the x-ray site for the car uh, on black carpet. And that's, um, it's very close to what's in the manual. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, I went with the kit setup that was in the manual. I don't know why, just because um, I, I wanted to start for myself, right? And the models will start where everybody else might start. Well, I, I, the funny thing is, is I pretty much ended up right where they are anyway. So they could have saved me half a day, but, uh, <laughs> but that's how you learn, right? You, like, right. I, I don't, I don't really like just putting setups on the car. I like learning. Just looking. So Jared's got a comment here to make a shim like the 12 scale car uses for the front. Yeah. J -Rock. Shim that covers both pivots. They have that. Coming. that. Um, it, it's in the manual. They have it coming. There's worry that it's going to change the flex of the chassis too much. Um, yeah. So we just have to get it and see. So that would basically anchor both sides of the chassis together. Kind of. Yes, exactly. It's going to, it's going to brace it across. Um, so, but what, you may do use that just to kind of fine tune or, or get a rough idea of the feel, excuse me. And then once you get the feel of the height you want, go back to the, um, the shims to, to get the same, uh, roll center height without the additional stiffness in the chassis. Right. Well, I know in the past, like, um, like the T4 chassis, the front was braced and the, the rear was, you know, the back is braced and the front of the, rear are, are open to float kind of thing so we yes the, something the like that in the future like okay i want to stiffen up the rear a little bit or the front i'll put the shim going from side to side but i'll leave like this the front part of the arm kind of free to to move independently um yeah i don't know they, they might do something like that the rear is braced across by the rear um shock mount um so you got a better shot of it there that's kind yeah. of it there eh? Yeah, that's the rear. So that's that's the shock mount braces, the bulkheads. Uh, and then on the front of the car, there's a, a graphite brace that you can put in the front. And there's an aluminum brace that goes behind the front, um, uh, the front lower mount, I guess. Can't can't see it in that. I wonder if you can see it on the car. Yeah. I'm just wondering if they even have a picture of it up here. Well, here's kind of a picture of their front mount, but... Yeah, the brace is on the other side. Anyway, there's there, there are some stiffness and some flex options that you can play with. Uh, okay. I started with all of them on the car, and then I took them off uh, from the front toward the back as I was testing each run, and I found I, I liked the car a little bit better as I removed flex options. Um, and then I ended up actually putting the flex uh, or the stiff or stiffening up the top deck a little bit. Um, kind of halfway through the day and thought the car was so, a little bit better. I'm just going to try and find a shot here of the top deck so you can kind of explain. On this one, is it very much different for stiffening up the top deck than it was for uh, the old T4 platform? Well, it is and it isn't. So the, the T4 platform had some stiffness settings in it as well. Right. Um, there was, you know, depending on how far back you go, there was various things like a, a steering post that you could install um or at one point there was even the four screws surrounding the um the spur gear that you could put in in the middle so this car has has similar flex settings um i don't know if it's gonna work right, well. let, me make, let me make your picture bigger, bigger. Here. all right so here. you can kind of see um these holes right, right there that one that one and those two and those you can insert these shouldered screws into um and they will make it stiffer and the reason they do that there's actually four of them there's two on either side because they also have a split top deck design you can do too where that's not connected down the middle so you need those two to keep it solid um, right i don't have that and I, do, I haven't played with having any more than the two shoulder screws in um, but i i did play with um the bearing and the two shouldered screws i thought that was a bit too stiff so i took out the bearing and the two shouldered screws closest to the spur gear i thought was really good um i'm not sure how that will translate on really high bite 
I, I kind of suspect it might promote a little bit of uh, snap traction rolling if it's that stiff. Uh, but find, even find out in weeks. during near the end of the weekend, there did you even have any issue with traction rolling? I didn't see any. Uh, yeah, I did a couple of times. I, I, I was just starting to get that. Um, I generally, for some reason, I don't know, I generally have pretty good luck and I, I don't end up in a spot where I'm traction rolling because I kind of know how to glue the tire as I go. Um, I, I also would consider myself quite a smooth, smooth on the wheel driver. So when there's not that abrupt weight transfer. Yeah, I also yeah. find like with our carpet uh, where we race, we're putting it down, taking it up, putting it down, taking it up every weekend, right? If there's a permanent facility like up in Edmonton at uh, 110, it's laid down all the time. And the traction that that carpet gets, because it just keeps on building and building and building, the compound goes down. I mean, you literally walk on that carpet, and then you walk on the floor, and you leave yeah. black marks on the floor because yeah. it's sticking to your feet. So yeah. the traction is way different. Well, you know, that's something that we should talk about. I mean, I, I don't know how many of the um, the local club guys or, or how many new guys are on road watching a stream right now. But um, one thing I did notice at our, our club race was the, the, the lack of knowledge around gluing tires. And unfortunately, it is kind of a necessary evil. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a necessary evil on the black carpet, no matter really the grip level. I mean, I, I can get away with running new tires without without glue um you know you just work to set up a little bit around it but as soon as you want to get into any kind of corner speed any kind of steering you, you need to build mechanically into the car and then glue the sidewall of the tire up so when the tire rolls over really far on the side instead of it continuing the grip it hits the glue and slides a little bit um so i, I know this we're not talking x the x4 but do you think that applies to every class right across the board yep Yep, foam tire, 12 scale, Euro truck, scale spec, mini, all of them. You pretty much always have to glue the front tire to some extent. Okay. Yeah. Good to know, good to know. Um, it's important to be precise when you glue, too. Um, you know, you see a lot of guys just kind of smush the glue on and, and kind of hope for the best. And you look at it later and it's all wavy. Well, <laughs> If you think about that, if you're in the middle of the sweeper and the glue is wavy, it's eventually going to grab something that's going to hit yeah. and you're going to flip anyway, right? So, right. you know, take the time. It's not that not that really big of a deal to take the time and get it right. And the other thing I want to mention is don't use fast drying um, CA glue because it usually dries harder and will crack and eventually start to wear off. So I find the best glue is the Proline glue. And if you don't spray it with accelerant, it'll take 20 or 30 minutes to, to set up and cure. Right. Um, but then you're done gluing, you know, for a long time. The Actually, the set I was running, the set of tires I was running on Saturday and Sunday morning, uh, I think was from a Wix race like two years ago. And I had, <laughs> that's when I glued it, you know. And it took that long to dry. No. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, and then also, I guess it's really handy to get yourself a uh, a super super fancy little tire gluing jig like you've got, because like I'm super jealous about that thing. Was... Yeah, if you're doing it a lot, it's nice to have one of those. Uh, right. Yeah, but um, I guess the other thing I noticed, like when when you do have a longer setup on a glue, even if you are a little bit sloppy and you get a little more on this side than this side, it's going to flow out after. A well, yeah, or you just wipe it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, you get a little bit that'll run down or something. You can just wipe it off with a blue towel and start again. So Darren's asking how the availability for replacement parts on the new model. Um, when I go on to when I go on to X Ray's site, um, most of the stuff that I've been looking for is showing in stock. I mean, it's a new model; they cranked out a bunch of parts. Um, I think you're probably right now going to find more issues with uh, you're going to find more issues with people still running T4s. And I think that's still right now. I think that's still the parts platform parts availability issue you're going to have because I don't think everybody there's a lot of people not running an X4 yet because they want to see how it works. Yeah, I think, right? I, you know, I, I would be very shocked if X-Ray didn't continue to support the T4 platform for 
a number of years. Like it, it's still a absolutely phenomenal car, and it's a, it's a, it can be a winning car at any race without a doubt, right? Um, so they'll they'll produce parts for that car for a long time, and the parts for the, the X4, yeah, you're right. They're they did hammer out um, a lot of spares right off the bat, and RC America has been ordering in what they can. Um, so it's not going to be an issue. Okay. Yeah. So my question for you, Luke, is what is your favorite? You pick one thing on that chassis. What's your favorite thing with that chassis? In terms of what? Of anything, just your favorite overall. You look at the chassis. It's like this is the one thing that I love the best about it. Well, I think, I think probably the motor mount, honestly, like the design and the, the functionality in the motor mount uh, is just so, so well thought out and, and thought through, you know, compared to previous models. There's, there's no more, yeah, there's no more coming up with your own battery backstops or one backstop is in the servo mount and the other's off the chassis in the back. You know, there's none of that. It's everything you need is now right there in the car, the belt tensioners, the backstops. Easy to change the picture. Um, it's solid one piece. Uh, yeah, that that to me was kind of like okay, they they finally absolutely nailed and perfected the motor mount, which is great. Nice. So the belt tensioners are on the motor mount. Mm -hmm. Are the front diffs? Are they still got the cam bearing on it, or cams out? Yeah, yeah. You can still adjust the whether you want to be a low or a high diff, and that's all the same. The, the diffs. The diff and the spool are slightly different from the T4, though. They're, they're, the casings are redesigned so the belt position is narrower on the chassis, um, which is nice. So it's, everything's a little bit more down the center line. Just trying to see if there's a good picture of the motor mount in here somewhere. Oh, there is in there somewhere. I remember, it's, yeah, I have seen it. Yeah. yeah there's now a picture of the spur. I guess this kind of helps tell you what the belt tensioner Yeah, that shows you the belt tensioners and the battery backstop, how it's built into the, the motor mount. Right. That's the other cool thing about it. They made it so the servo mount is reversible now, so you don't have to have a separate uh, piece to put the servo mount in the forward position, which moves the flex forward on the car. So you get you get all of that included now, which is great. And the aluminum steering arms. Um, yeah, they've really gone over and above to kind of get you to the point where you don't need any pop-ups or any option parts. You can buy this, and you pretty much have everything that the team guys are running. Oh, that's nice. So I know um, what do you foresee fast, being the first thing you're going to break? Sorry, what was that? What do you foresee oh. being the first thing you're going to break? Ooh, I don't know. Um, I, I honestly, I can't look at it and find a weak point. I know there is a weak point because there has to be, but I, I can't, I couldn't find it while I was building it. If I would say that the if there's one thing I'm worried about, it's the carbon fiber not getting weak and splitting, but I guess I guess guys call it delaminating from the plastic, but it's not laminated, so that's not really the right term. But um, the inlaid carbon fiber in the arms, yeah. I believe, can possibly become soft uh, over time, or could come out, I guess, in a in a big enough crash. Although, yeah. You know, the cool thing is, is like I follow the thread online and on RC Tech and talk to the team. And so far, there hasn't been like one major issue point. Like there's not this one thing that everybody keeps having to fix. So, yeah, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, when I look at it, the first thing I think of is usually hubs. Seems to be where people break things all the time anyways, right? And they're still the same old plastic, nothing carbon fiber inlaid. Uh, uh, I actually don't know the the grade of plastic that they've made these hubs out of, but I can tell you they're not the same as the old ones. It, it is definitely a more robust material. I don't know what it is, but it's it feels stronger, and the design of it is, uh, in my opinion, more robust as well now. So X-Ray with the T4 platform, you used to be able to get your regular and then your hard and your different grades of plastic. Is that in the future? for the X4 platform or do they I not see the, it this time? Yeah, I think the options right now are either the, the plastic ones or aluminum hubs. Um, 
I don't know if they have intention of making soft ones. I don't think they would make any difference on this car, honestly. Um, but you can get different, um, I guess, strengths of arms. So the the carbon fiber kit comes with um, softer arms, or I guess medium arms, and the aluminum kit comes with hard ones. Hey, Dave. What's up, Dave? <laughs> I love Dave. So uh, I have a question for you. Why are there two different alloy chassis? I believe there's three. Um, three, there's, yeah. Yeah, so there's the, the, the solid, the, the aluminum, the Aluflex edition, and then we have the Aluflex edition, aluminum solid edition, and yeah. graphite edition. Yeah, so is, there an, is there an ultra flex yet? Anyway, the it's a good the question. Mic. You know, um, the the more the car will flex, generally the more grip, uh, grip it will generate. So on asphalt, guys are you know you want to run carbon fiber on low grip carpet like in Europe, where they're still on what would be considered uh, comparable to our old gray carpet, or even lower grip, um, they're running a flex aluminum chassis, and then with our super high grip here in North America on the black carpet. Um, that's when we basically want to eliminate as much flex from the car as possible. I guess so that when you're talking high grip in North America and, and Europe and stuff, you had a chance to go across overseas and run anything yet? Oh, uh, not yet, man. But Is I'm there trying. a track that you want to go to? Uh, I, I want to go see the, the Hoodie Arena. The Hoodie Arena? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that whole facility is phenomenal. But um, oh, there, there's tracks in Japan. There's everywhere. There, there's so many beautiful tracks out there. Some of those ribbon style asphalt tracks in Europe are gorgeous too. So there's, there's lots. The girlfriend and I have been talking about doing a trip to Europe and uh, fitting in a couple of races. So see if that happens next year. Where you just hang, you just stand there at the side and drool over the track and just pretty wish. much. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna see if I can sweet talk the X-ray guys into setting up an arrive and drive for me. So I just show up with my radio and a receiver and and use a car. I think that's a stretch, but I'm gonna try. You never know, right? No. Never hurts to ask. So um, solid edition, I guess, is going to be. Yeah, that's what everybody's buying in North America. There's a few guys around here who bought the Flex one, um, which I actually think is easier to drive because it generates more, a little bit more grip, and it kind of uh, is softer feeling. So it mm -hmm. can be easier to drive, whereas the solid chassis is uh, very responsive um, initially obviously because it's not the you know you, you turn and the chassis doesn't flex right so you immediately get steering so um i think this the the flex chassis are probably easier to drive and might be a better choice for the majority of club racers or or new drivers um but if right. you want to you know really compete at some of the bigger races you probably need to show up on the on the solid chassis um so something else i noticed on here compared like 2021, they had the battery hold downs in here still, but most people still keep running just tape. Um, are you as running? You all discovered, as, as you discovered, tape is a terrible, terrible idea. Yeah, well, I got a car that doesn't have the hold downs, so <laughs> well, I mean, you just got to make sure you put the tape on lighter. Um, yeah, that's something I, I don't surprisingly ran into a couple of times at both of our club races this year is guys with their batteries taped into the car so hard that it's causing the chassis to, to bow almost like a freaking canoe or something and uh you know you put it on your pit board and try to set it up and try to work on it and the thing's rocking around and you take the battery tape off and boom it flattens out tweaks gone drives better on the track so when you guys are mounting your battery in the car leave lots of power and lots of room uh you know who this guy's talking about or what <laughs> <laughs> you don't need a wrench on it like it's electrical tape going on there yeah i don't i don't know if this is gonna, you're gonna be able to see it. but you can't really tell. It's got some movement. Oh, yeah. There's a little There's bit of movement there, yeah. There it is. Yeah, it needs to be able to float. And and that letting the battery float is going to let the chassis and, and the car breathe and uh, not be restricted right. like your tape. So. Okay, note to self. Get rid of tape. Okay. <laughs> and don't tighten down the battery so tight. No, it needs to like, it should float like a millimeter or two millimeters in every direction. Or or I could, uh, you know, if I actually had battery hold downs, I might not have lost my battery in the last race. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, time to get a... Hitting the wall 
had nothing to do with it. And no. breaking the arm? And breaking the arm had nothing to do with it. Like, no, no. That's, just, <laughs> that's just lack of focus, man. That's all that is. So, Luke. Yeah. Out of everybody that goes racing, you got the guy that wrenches on his car probably the most. So what are you doing between each round? Like, what are the things that you do change in your setup from round one to the main? Well, if the car is already working and handling the way I like it, um, generally you would just do a few small things. Like, you, you might reduce camber gain in the front. So the camber gain is basically controlled by the angle of the front arms. The more... Um, the more angled the arms are, so lower on the inside and higher on the outside, the more camber is going to be added to the tire under compression. So you can you can reduce that by leveling that arm out more, um, whether that's lowering the outside of the link or raising the inside of the link. Uh, and you don't do that much, like maybe a half a mil throughout a whole race day, you might make that adjustment. Um, reducing rear toe. Uh, by default, the T4 has three degrees of toe in on the rear. Um, the X4 I have set up at two degrees rear toe in. But as the grip comes up, you, you start to feel the rear end of the car become what we describe as tight or locked in. Um, and it creates the, the car, makes it a little bit pushy. So we, by removing that little bit of rear toe, it helps free it up a little bit. Um, the X4 has ARS built into it. Um, just which is, well, yeah, so you can you can easily change the toe just by the link, but you can also change the shims, um, the bump steer shims in the rear to to either add or remove toe on compression as well. So that's something that I'm going to be playing a lot with. I've kept it all as per the manual so far, but um, in super high grip, you can actually have the car remove toe under compression um, or add toe if you set it up that way, like on asphalt sometimes. For corner exit speed, you want it to add toe as soon as you get on power. Um, on carpet, you know, in mid corner, you want it to reduce toe. So, so those are kind of the things you do throughout the day as grip progresses. But more importantly than that, um, the one thing I do between every round and every time I put the car on uh, the carpet is just run through the steering geometry, um, check the endpoints, check your tweak. Um, check your droop, kind of just go through the car front to back and make sure that when you put it on the track, you know exactly what it's going to do. Um, the worst thing, in my opinion, that guys do to themselves is they don't look at their car. They throw it on the track. They do two or three laps. They realize it's pulling slightly to the left. So they're trying to trim it out, going down the straightaway and warm up, or they're just, you know, they're, they're kind of struggling to get a handle on the car because they didn't do any maintenance or looking at it between rounds. And then they've wasted their warm up and pretty much, in my opinion, wasted that entire run because you're mentally having to recalibrate driving around a car that is not, you know, perfect or close to perfect. So when you put the car on the track, you should know that it goes straight. It turns left and right equally. It's not tweaked and the ride height is correct and the droop is correct. Like you should, all that stuff should be checked and confirmed um, every time the car goes on the track. Once you get into a rhythm, it only takes five minutes. It's easy to do all of that, but right. something that a lot of guys don't do. You know, and a clean bench and a setup clean too. Bench, actually. Yeah. Clean, shot towels, a little brush, yeah. tiny vacuum. Um, we should actually do a session one night where we go through my uh, between round routine. Uh, it's just pretty much the same every time. It only takes 10, 15 minutes, but we should do that one night, do a tech session and, and go over that because it's it's super, super important. And instead of spending those first 30 seconds or minute on the track trying to, you know, reprogram your brain to drive around a car that you neglected, you can instead test the limit of the car, see if you're going to traction well and figure out where your issues might be. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a positive thing instead of just right. fighting the car. Um, we were talking about what the weak parts are. I'm going to make a prediction here, and I might be totally wrong, but I think that the first part that people are going to find breaking all the time on this sucker is right here. Mm. But I, I don't agree. I actually think they got that 
really well. When you build it, you will say the same thing. Um, that ball stud goes into a lot of really good material and it goes in much deeper than on the on the T4. I and yeah, I, d I don't think that's going to be a weak spot. I think, um, I hate to say it, but I think the aluminum steering arm is going to be a weak spot before that. This part in here? No, on the outside yeah. connected to the bottom of the hub. Oh, yeah, yeah, this part here. Yeah, I, I suspect if there is a weak spot, that's it. Yeah, because it's not like um, it goes over top of some plastic in there. Uh, yeah, it does. The bottom of the hub has a has a notch, and then the uh, aluminum yeah, arm slides around that notch. But the area on the aluminum arm is relatively thin. Um, the outer area of it, I would say it's two or three millimeters. And so I could see that breaking, and I can see the arm potentially bending in a, in a hard enough crash. Um, right. But again, that's going to depend on how you have your servo saver set up. If you're running a servo saver and it absorbs the impact, um, that's going to save that arm. But if you're running an aluminum arm on your servo and it doesn't budge, then the servo. You, yeah, the servo might not budge, and then it, that could be the weak spot. Is this uh, running the standard X-ray servo saver that they normally run? Yeah, that hasn't that changed in a hundred years, and I don't think it'll ever change. It's okay. the best servo saver on the market. Yeah, <laughs> I know who this is. Tim says he can he can test the strength in a crash. I'm pretty sure that's Tim. <laughs> There's a lot of guys around here who can do that. Yeah, yeah. Hey. I proved last week, not this weekend when you brought your new car out, but I proved the week before that torque is how far you move the wall. So I completely <laughs> removed part of the track. And we ran for what? Another 10, 15 laps with that piece totally gone. So, you, you know, I, 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 did, uh, I did hit my car pretty good once. Uh, I think it – was it on Saturday night or one of the practice sessions during Sunday? I that center section coming down toward the bottom left of the track, I nailed it off a wall, flipped it over, and no issues. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty good crash. So I'm just looking here, see if there's anything else. Aaron, what else are you thinking? Um, one other thing I, I noticed, um, just going back quite a few years, so. Uh, T4 came out. They had the servo mount off center for a couple of seasons. Then they moved to you know right down the center, right mm -hmm. for the flexing and whatnot. And I noticed on this one here because the belt goes down the center, they actually have the servo mount off center again. Yeah, I noticed that too, and I find it interesting um, that that note that comment. Uh, so what, what Aaron's talking about here is Make these screw, screw holes here are right. for the servo, um, but the center line of the chassis is here. So this is off-center just a hair um, toward the side of the chassis. And you know, it's funny. I noticed that, and I noticed the that the, the top deck is no longer symmetrical. And I, no. I, meant, I actually mentioned this. Symmetrical meaning it doesn't match on both sides here. Um, so it's just connected right here. And right. I had I mentioned this to Martin Hoodie that I and Alex Egbert that I was surprised that to see it when I built it because they were so adamant on symmetry and the flex of the car staying the same on both sides. And they just said, you know, we we tested every possible combination, we tested every position of the servo, every position of the top deck, both symmetrical and non-symmetrical, and we chose the one that had the best performance, and it turned out that. Um, the symmetry wasn't as important as they nearly thought or, or initially thought. So, um, yeah, I was surprised to see it, but. Yeah, you can actually see it pretty good here in this image here. You got your top bark, your, your top yep. support goes over the side. And then on the old 2021, it went on both sides of the spur. Yeah, they kept it symmetrical, trying to keep the flex the same right. both directions, but. What they basically said was, you know, on one side of the chassis, you have a battery that's floating free. And on the other side, you have a bunch of stuff taped down to the chassis, a motor hanging off the center line. And then, of course, that <laughs> servo hanging off the center line. So 
the 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 flex of the chassis wasn't going to be the same and symmetrical anyway so you may as well just build whatever's going to be fastest right right makes sense I, I was kind of surprised when i saw it too because i was like you know that was like a, their upgrade was from going from you know here to the center line in that one one year and it was like yeah. okay that's the upgrade right yeah so and now a chassis now it's got the you know servo down the center and I, i'm i'm up with it i'm good yeah, but you know, the one thing they did add, which I love, is they made the outer um, mount for the servo on the outside. It's it's adjustable and it slides a little bit uh, to fit slightly different widths of servos. <coughs> I don't know if we can see that. Anything. It always bugs me because the, the, uh, the servo I ran was just a little bit too short for the position they had in the mount. And so the little the little bar that supports it right here, this bar here, uh, previously for me would lean in to get both the screws in place um but oh, now yeah, yeah now you can kind of see there's a little gap here on the other side of that screw there's a slot where that can this bar can now slide uh, i'm doing a freaking terrible job of showing this so it, it kind of floats basically in a instead yeah. of being perfectly round hole it's oval somewhere. yeah exactly it's, it's elongated so you can slide this mount um to to properly secure your servo. Not that it wasn't before, but it's a little bit better now. Right. It's such a good looking car. <laughs> it's cause it's shiny and new. Well, they should always be shiny. <laughs> yeah, but you they're not always new. Car. So you have too many RCs. You just gotta have, you just gotta get it back down to like two or three at the most. And they're all gonna be shiny and clean all the time. I'm working on it. Yeah, yeah it's OCD on it, and then you're good to go, right? That's yeah. not. That's a lie. I'm not working on it at all. <laughs> so, Every so time one, I sit down, I'm like, the, I should start another one. Yeah. The the one question that I was expecting you guys to ask, but you haven't, which I'm going to answer anyway. Um, should guys up upgrade to this car? Oh, Frankie B, what's up, man? Hope hopefully see you next weekend. Um, the should guys upgrade to the car? Well. The, the sponsored driver in me says, yes, absolutely. Buy the car, buy all the parts, spend all your money, um, support the lo local hobby shop and, and get the new car. Um, but, you know, realistically, do I think this is going to be a faster platform for the average driver? I, I have my doubts about that. Um, I don't think that a guy who's just getting into the hobby is going to go quicker with this than he would a one-year-old T4 um the car okay it's an x-ray so we expect it to be relatively expensive anyway and it is there's no there's no doubt about that and as much as it's fun to build and it's you know it's a beautiful car and if you can afford it if you have the budget i definitely recommend upgrading to it but i think there's probably better things the average club racer um can spend their money on in in the hobby before upgrading from like a you know a 19 or a 20 or a 21 t4 to this um if you have older than that uh then i would then i would say instead of upgrading to it to a t421 or a t420 uh you know instead of buying a used one save up a little bit of extra money and and bump up to this but if you're already sitting on a 1920 or 21 um i'd say you're probably pretty good with that for a while uh, and i wouldn't be rushing out to to spend the money right now i would say for the most part for most people around here i mean, it's a big jump to go and buy uh, a race platform this isn't this isn't going out and buying a traxxas slash and you know it's all plastic and you, know, you can do all these upgrades and all this stuff i mean the price point on a traxxas slash you have maybe paid for the electronics on this you know like maybe yeah. yeah, right. I mean, the platform alone on this is uh, more expensive than some of the one eighth scale RTRs that you find out there for buggies and cars, right? Um, it's a big jump. And I, being a shop owner, would absolutely love everybody to be coming in and buying them. But I also don't want to see people coming in, dumping thousands of dollars into it. Take the money, take your money and put it into tools and setup station and, you know, Radio. something where you could take an old platform and still go 
fast or be competitive with it and have fun. If you're not having fun because you've pissed away all your money on the newest and shiniest thing out there. Yeah. You're just killing yourself and it kills the hobby. Yeah. I, I think the order of the order of things that you should spend money on in the hobby. If I, if I were to redo my quote career again, I would buy the best, the highest end radio right off the bat. Yeah. I agree with you right there. I, I would just jump straight to the Sanwa M17 and I'd buy that and not look back. Oh, um, I thought you were going to say the Traxxas. <laughs> the oh. the difference between the feel that you get on the track between the various levels of radio is just a massive, massive difference. And so, you know, if, if you got $2,000 to spend to get into the hobby, spend 700 bucks at that <coughs> and buy yourself a used car, used speed controller, used motor, used everything else and scrape by for a year or two. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the firm, I, most of the guys and with our track, we don't have a huge turnout of people locally. Uh, we're trying to build this back up and get it going. And, and uh, I think all three of us involved here would love to see a turnout of 50 people at a race weekend. That would be phenomenal. Is that ever going to happen in the Okanagan? I doubt that. Um, there's so many other there last weekend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the Okanagan that, draws people away from one hobby to the other yeah um so that's kind of a yeah scott says I just scott says he'd rather crash his t3 than crash his an x4 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. um you know and and um being that i think that if the guys go in a little cheaper on the chassis maybe find something used get yourself experienced Get in some time on the track, running. Get smooth. Then when you start getting competitive and you're up there, you know, racing against Luke and racing against Mike and the other fast guys at the track and Aaron and all that, then start looking at upgrading your chassis because now you need those little tweaks. You need those little improvements because that's what separates the fat, really, really fast guys from the fast guys. Yeah, to a certain extent, I agree. Um, I, I still feel that I could I could grab a you know a T four nineteen or twenty or even eighteen and, and be relatively competitive at any race in BC. You right. Know? Um, but would you take your T four down to a big race in the states right now? Yeah, I would. With me, yeah. when half the other field is running the new X four. Man, but uh, there's you know there's a handful of us that had that T four running damn good. You know. Like, right. Like the. I mean, like, don't forget that the T4 is a is a multi-time national champion. You know, like, it's it's still a phenomenal car. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, if we uh, if we just keep the guys coming out, and also, I mean, the guys who are upgrading to the new chassis to the X4, they probably have a T4 that they don't want to have sitting on a shelf. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, right. you guys know, sell them stuff. Yeah, and um, you know that's always that's definitely the best place to buy it. Like, look for the guys who are upgrading and snatch their stuff. Uh, some people before others, perhaps. So Kelly's up in White Court. So the old carpet from Kelowna is in. Oh, right okay, and this is uh, he's running the club up there that we started. And, uh, yeah, 12 racers now, five of them are x-rays. We started out running uh, Traxxas Vortex and <laughs> uh, Viterra V100s and basically RTR platforms that you could buy and just put something on the track and go uh, to get the ball rolling. And then the guys started getting faster and started buying used stuff from Edmonton and Grand Prairie where the other local close tracks were. And so they've been building up pretty good. I mean, 12 nights, 12 racers. Uh, That's great. Yeah. You know, they're Wonderful. getting a pretty good showing. Right on. You know, what's mine? Mine's a 19. I got two. A T419 is a great car. I, like, I wouldn't say I still run a T419. I would proudly say I run a T419. I mean, yeah, honestly, there's guys out there running old, old platforms that are still faster. Like you said, smooth. It's your driving. It's your, 
it's your trigger time that you've had, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, trigger time's number one for sure. Get I wish we had a facility that was open seven days a week that you could go in there on a practice night and a practice and evening and just bang out laps and burn through battery packs. And I wish that you had to go through a set of tires every two weeks. You know, you put new ones on because you wore the other ones out. But uh, yeah. we don't have that yeah. yet. That would be nice. That's that's definitely the point where I started to become relatively quick is when I moved down to Victoria and basically lived at Blake's track for six months. Literally, like I worked from the track. I would I brought I bring my laptop, I'd be charging a pack and saw some tires while it was all you know, while that's going on, I'm working, and then I'd go run a pack for five minutes, come back, work for 45, and go back out again. I must have done I don't know, at least at least five to ten thousand laps a month for those six months, you know. <laughs> Terrible way to spend a coffee break. <laughs> no kidding, Terrible. right? It's pretty nice. Yeah. <laughs> five sets of tires every two weeks. Yeah. Well, hey. Uh you don't have to worry about that. Those those sweep QTS 32s that we're using, the like I said, the ones that I had on my car uh up right up until Saturday and the morning of Sunday. I've been using literally for two years. Like I must have a hundred plus runs, 200 probably runs on those tires. Right. So no, you, you don't have to do that. Uh, you're jumping around from track to track. And I guess Kelly and these guys would probably be interested. I know um, they're running the old gray style carpet that we used to have in <coughs> here at the Kelowna club. Um, when you go from one location to another and you're running different styles of have you noticed a big difference in tire wear on different tracks different types of carpet at all um well with with rubber tire on touring cars you don't really have much for tire wear um but the different tires that the different spec tires that you use will have different um mm. fall off curves right unfortunately there's a lot of tires out there that you know, the first three runs or two runs are two or three tenths quicker than runs three through 10. And then after that, they just become so slow. Um, foam tire, yeah, obviously every track is going to wear differently and everything. Um, again, that's another reason I love the sweep tires is there's no fall off. They're the same, most part from the, they're the same from the, when you take them out of the package to 30, 40 runs in. So do you think that uh, X-Ray is going to do anything amazing with the uh, X1 chassis now? Oh, I have no idea. I haven't followed it at all. Um, the, the last year's car I saw, it looked like there were some pretty significant and awesome updates on that. Um, but I really haven't been following that. I mean, I have an F1 and I've raced it twice, three times maybe, four times. Right. Um, so not really very serious about f1 i have i have a little bit of a soft spot just because i think they look so badass with our other track they just <laughs> look awesome yeah I, I like how they look too um yeah i'd like to race it more but it's not really of my focus no yeah although i am going to try it in cleveland I, I did race it at snowbirds two years ago when i went down and uh qualified second actually i was on a tq run at one point too uh so like to think I can drive it okay. <laughs> what, uh, I guess on your schedule, kind of play it by ear, depending on COVID restrictions and all this other travel stuff. Uh, what are your plans this year for racing? Where, what big races are you planning on hitting up? Well, the, the only one that I have scheduled at the moment is Cleveland Champs, which is the end of this month. After that, I'm just going to see how this one goes. Because if traveling is a pain in the ass or I'm not allowed to come back to Canada, I have to move to uruguay or something then you know things are going to change um so we're just gonna have to play it by ear i'd like to do snowbirds again um the flip side of all this is i also have that monster truck so a lot of my time is going to be <laughs> taken driving that around i want to go down to california and go down to king of hammers and do that and yeah when, get when you say monster truck we're talking rock bouncer like legit right. legit rock crawler monster truck on 58 yeah, yeah legit let's see if i can even I might even be able to find it here. It's my, my how'd you come across. How'd you get that? How'd you win that? Cause that 
the header of my profile, like on my Facebook profile, has the best picture of it. Yeah, that's so I was gonna look at it here. Uh, so there's a there's a there's a Facebook page called Axel Busters Off Road and Racing Parts, and I don't know how I initially got invited to look at that. Obviously via the off road community, but um, yeah, they they do like these internet waffles where they do a uh, you know a sticker giveaway contest thing, and uh, yeah, there she is. That's really yeah. cool right there. Um, yeah, and so I bought a few hundred bucks worth of tickets on this uh, this particular giveaway, and sure enough, I won the fucking thing. A web designer who has zero mechanical ability. <laughs> and not even a garage to fit it in, right? Yeah, no garage, no truck to tow it with, no trailer to tow it on, no tools to work on it, no knowledge to work on it. But been learning. Now, you know, I joke about it. <laughs> I, I spent five hundred dollars in tickets, won the thing, and now I've spent about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> because wow. I've been, I had to work on it, and then I had to buy a truck to tow it. So I bought a big, you know, a big Duramax, and then a trailer. Yeah, it's been been quite the project. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It's fun so yeah, I'd like it'd be pretty badass to take that thing down to Moab and actually do some serious, serious off roading with it and uh, see how she sticks to the slick rock and. Yeah, totally. That, that's what I'll be doing that in uh, in January, the end of January and beginning of February. Where I'm going to drive down and go do King of Hammers and hang out and go do some of those trails and things down there. Cool. Yeah, but cool. the funnest the funnest thing is snow wheeling in it. Like going well, I know some guys who want a snow wheel. I know a bunch of guys that want a snow wheel. So, well, let me know. I can take them. No, like the guys that have Jeeps that set them up for snow wheeling that want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, can... there's a, there's a big group of us here. I mean, all these guys in this photo, this was, this photo was a month or two ago up in um, Valmont. And yeah. So all this guys of this group of guys here will be going. So cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, that pretty much wraps it up for unless we got any more questions. Anybody got questions in the comments here for Luke? If you do, ask him now before we stop talking about the X4 and talk about some other things. Yeah, you can you, – you, obviously, you're welcome to send me a private message too or, or post on my wall or ask questions or find me at a track, uh, whatever you guys want. I'm happy to help anytime. And – if there's enough interest, talk to uh, talk to these guys and let them know if there's enough interest. We'll do a um, um, kind of a, maybe some kind of tech session. Maybe not on this night because you guys have your bench talk thing, but maybe we'll do a separate night where it's just like an hour or two hours and we'll just do like a Q&A and I'll go through all my setup routine and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We can do it and uh, we can do it through through this set up as well we could do it as a uh, an online we could still do it as a live so everybody can watch still yeah uh, but we just won't do it during the regular scheduled bench talk yeah exactly cool thanks guys all right man so thanks for coming on luke everybody say hi oh showtime wants to know whether or not you miss him oh i miss mark incredibly i love mark mark and i had the greatest race of all time like my highlight race of rc was with Mark Frechette at one of my first trips to the Canadian Nats uh, four or five years ago now. Mark and I were in the B main, and I qualified second in the B main. Mark was third. We don't even remember who won the race, but this was still when the race was in the middle of the mall. And I'll never, I'll never forget this. There must have been two, three, maybe 400 people surrounding the track all watching. And the tone went... And I held off Mark for the entire five minutes with him right on my bumper. And the battle was so great and so fun and so awesome that we finished the race. The crowd was cheering and nobody knew who won the race. It was so hilarious. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the kind of racing I would love to see going on here. In fact, anywhere. Just local. Somewhere within a four-hour drive would be nice. Yeah. You know that you know you get the fans where it's actually fun for them to watch, not uh, yeah. Oh, he crashed again. Oh, oh, he crashed again. You know, <laughs> actual good racing. Yeah, it was it was pretty special <coughs> when, when they had that race in the middle of the mall. There, um, they're still in the mall. Oh, they're still in the mall, but they're in a a Target building, an old Target building, I think. So it's a little bit outside of the path of the public. But 
when it was in the middle of the mall, it was pretty special. We, we got to try to do something like that in BC. Like there has to be a mall where we can set up our track and, and race, you know, we, we got to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, or a car show. And, we've been looking car show worked good. Uh, that yeah. walking street heat. That was awesome. We had a lot of publicity back from it. Next year will be bigger for sure. Yeah. Uh, because we're going to actually have more time to plan it and get it all set up. We've got a way better, asphalt track set up now we've got way better barriers going now you know get away from your two by fours and all that stuff right so um because next year aaron and i we plan on running thursday night race series basically um yeah, we're going to be setting up every thursday yeah uh, we're also going to be doing drag racing on what mondays yeah mondays probably we'll see what so basically uh, it's a week solid of you're going to be racing rcs of some form yeah. yeah. So, you know, and then once we have all that stuff all kind of buttoned up and figured out and lined up a little better, we'll have a hell of a really good event. We're also going to try and do some events at some other, not just uh, Watkins Ford, but we're going to do maybe the Chevy dealership, you know, stuff like that. Anywhere there's a nice big empty parking lot, we're going to hit them up. Yeah. Get on sure. good drag. That's a key thing to get out where the public is. Right. Um, where yeah. everybody sees it. That's going to be key. Um, like Travis has got the trailer for us to use, and we intend on using it. You know, we can go yeah. anywhere in the Okanagan. Yeah, it was amazing cool. that weekend. Like, so many people came up, and they'd, they'd never heard of this before. They're like, where do you yeah. guys race? It? Where is this from? Where are you guys? <laughs> We're like, we're local. We're from here. Yeah. This new? Like, <laughs> no. like, you live in yeah, that was like when we did that, uh, the Father's Day car show. Like, that was phenomenal. We had hundreds, if not maybe a thousand plus people walked by when we were doing that. So, oh, that was hopefully Boyd. Yeah, hopefully Boyd's is allowed to, to do that event again, and hopefully we can get in there and run again there. Yeah, the same spot would work fine. It would, but if we're doing it, we gotta we gotta do at least a two day, full two day, even if there's no spectators on the Saturday. Um, yeah. But you know, if we want close racing, we gotta get you know Blake Bell and John Sang and some of those Vancouver and Victoria guys down here. So so you know, a few of us can have a really strong high-end battle to for you know people to really watch so yeah but they're not going to come down for a one-day race I, I don't blame them so if we're doing yeah, that we'll track like, time to line up the cars and get them tuned in and dialed well not only that but just you like there's no point in just coming down to have you know one day racing 25 minutes of, of being on the track right they, they want to have two or two and a half days of racing so for me that and, whole weekend was a blur so yeah me too i mean i was basically chasing after Two wheel drive slashes for <laughs> that was so awesome with a lineup of kids waiting to drive all oh. things in. that was so great yeah yeah i mean they people. they all enjoyed it and that's awesome but i was like pulling my hair out going oh my god why could you hit the wall again what the... are you yeah. aiming for that trigger. yeah it was yeah. pretty wild and, and there were a couple of hurt ankles around there yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah quite a few all right, fellas, I'm going to leave you to your uh, the rest of your evening. Thanks for All right, me thank on. you for coming on, and uh, we will see you next race weekend. Sounds good. See you guys. See you later. later.